Right, good evening and welcome to another edition of Radio Yes Cymru, the podcast which is online on YouTube and on your favourite podcast app. And I'm very excited about discussing the discussion tonight. Uh, it's with Robin McAlpine from the Common Wheel, one of the founders of the Common Wheel uh, think tank up in Scotland, and a man I met down in Swansea in January for the Melin Dravod, which is a Welsh uh, pro independence think tank, very much based on Common Wheel and the good work you're doing up there in Scotland. We went for Indians after this independence summit in Swansea. Uh, uh, Robin, you told me. Sturgeon won't be at the FM by the end of this year at the latest. And I thought, are you mad? And uh, you were right. So it's 1 0 to Robin. So, Robin McAlpine, just a quick word about yourself. You used to work for a, a Labour MP, if I remember correctly. Maybe just explain that quickly where you live, what your job is with Commonweal, and then we really get into what's actually happening in Scotland. Because to us, in ways, it looks absolutely mad. We can't believe this has happened. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, I was so I was a journalist and I grew up in the devolution era. My mother was a leading independence campaigner. I've always believed in independence. Right. But in the 1980s, she was the, among other things, she was the chair of the Constitutional Convention that created the Scottish Parliament. Oh, right, okay. So in the 90s, when I was um, just starting out my career, there was only one game in town. It was one independent, one the Scottish Parliament yeah. back or don't. Yeah. And the fastest way to do that was Labour. So yeah. I did join. Um, I was the press officer for the Shadow Secretary of State of Scotland when he was uh, in the run up to the 97 election. So what was his name? Uh, George Robertson. So, oh, right, okay. Was my, my, was my boss. That's it. Um, and it put me off Westminster politics for life. <laughs> I mean, seriously, a horrible okay. place. I, just, I hated <laughs> Westminster so much. So I learned an enormous amount. It was very yeah. useful. But what I did was I brought that back up and I worked in environmental policy and then was a, a, I was a political law strategist for the okay. university sector for years. And then what happened was I just got to this point where as a as a as a independent supporting lefty, yeah, I was sitting at nights and thinking, um, how do we change the world? And I was sitting during the day and saying, how do we get things done? And then I suddenly realized nighttime Robin and daytime Robin are quite different people. And if nighttime Robin was daytime Robin's client, daytime Robin would tell nighttime Robin to get his kind act together. <laughs> so basically I chucked it all and try to bring the kind of professional strategic approaches that lobbyists and, um, and strategists bring yep. to commercial activity and lobbying to good causes, because very often they have to operate without it. So that was what um, Commonweal was. It, it was it, it kind of blew up during the independence referendum. It became its own standalone think tank. And we just do policy development work on anything that we think is useful right, right. across the spectrum of Scottish politics and independence politics and, and beyond. So that's right. What well, we'll, we'll give a link to the Commonweal and also to Merlin Dravod uh, with this uh, web, web, website on the, the YouTube. Uh, yeah, so basically we're here now. It's the 27th of February. I'm Sean Jobbins, in case I didn't introduce myself. Uh, Nicholas Sturgeon stood down about a week ago now. We've got three candidates, Ash Regan, Hamza Youssef and Kate Forbes. I've never heard of Ash or Kate until this week. I'd heard of Hamza, of course, because he's quite well known and been a minister for a few years. So, Robin, could you just tell us why did Sturgeon stand down, which again, I'm surprised at. We'll come to that later. And then maybe we'll get, get into the three main candidates and what do you think they represent in terms of what the SNP uh, the strands they represent in the SNP and the wider independence uh, uh, movement. So why does Sturgeon stand down? Right, well, I think it's important for me to start. I always think um, open declaration of interests is always yeah. useful at these points. I've been a Sturgeon critic for a number of years now. Yeah. Um, I had come to believe that she was the barrier, not the path um, to the, the cause of Scottish independence, and I'll explain that. So yeah. do take everything I'm saying with a pinch of salt, yeah. um, <clears throat> but... Um, the, pro the primary problem is that Sturgeon's strategy had run past the end of its track. So this was the primary reason why it was inevitable that she wouldn't be able to stay on. Um, in my opinion, again, as a political strategist, it was rash for her to promise a referendum on Brexit morning. So, for I mean, I, I, I my second child was adopted, and by a, a, an act of terrible preparation and timing, we picked him up on Brexit morning. I thought it was going to be narrow. <laughs> I know. I thought it was going to be narrow to me. I'm standing in a supermarket getting um, flowers and chocolates for the foster mum yeah. to take our new son home. And the phone goes. And, and one of my team says, Nicholas Sturgeon's just announced that there's going to be a referendum. 
my precise words to him were, with the swear words taken out, <laughs> that's not likely to be true. I had to think that one through there. That's not <laughs> likely to be true because that would be an absolutely crazy thing to say because there's zero chance that she'll be able to deliver that. Because what she said was she'd have a referendum within two years before the Brexit negotiations right. were complete. Okay. Now, that was never, apart from the fact that the UK government was never going to give that, yeah. um, that was never realistic anyway because, you know, just as a Democrat, if, if you're saying to people, I want you to choose between two futures, you can't say, but I'm going to make you do that before you find out what one of them is. So it was only reasonable that we got the Brexit negotiated deal so that if even if we were having a referendum, you would need to give them time to let that follow through. So it was rash, but more to the point, it was strategically rash because it, this is, again, a, a, as a professional political strategist, see when you get abstract changes, so abstract changes, which are things that conceptually you're not happy about, abstract changes in, in public life, conceptually you're not happy about, but you're not experiencing the impact of, Yeah. But those key blips. Because what happens is you go, oh, Brexit, this is this lot are mad. God, I'm going to support independence. Yeah. And then it's, um, oh, we're out of milk, we better head down to the supermarket. And it always fades. You've got to, you, to keep sustained bumps like that. People have got to start to feel or, or someone's got to convert it. And that's exactly what happened. Within a week, the boost that we got from the Brexit referendum came back down, and we're back down to where our baseline basically was. And from that point onwards, what happened was, having promised one, and therefore having turned the entire debate about Scottish independence into one of purely process. Everything's okay. been about process. How do we get a referendum? How do we get a referendum? We've not been talking to the public. We've not been developing the case for independence. It's as threadbare as, well, that's the rough. Quite a bit of work's done. Every yeah. gap that was in the case in 2014 is still there. But maybe, maybe the case, work done. but maybe what Sturgeon come back or support is, or maybe what I was thinking, you know, okay, she is making a case in that, you know, the alternative narrative is that the SNP is now by far the strongest party. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's on some like 50%, 45%, 50 of the vote. Independence is consistently over 50%. These things go up and down a bit, but it's over 50%. You know, so in a way, she's making a case um, that you know, Scotland could run itself. It was running itself better, or people felt it was. The main party for independence was by far the strongest party. So, you know, five years, six years, whatever, after Brexit, you know, why you rock the boat now? Why why you wait to 300 years? Why not wait a couple more years? So basically, there's a generation change. So let me, let me, let me just talk through okay. a little bit more where we got to with that. So what happened was, focused all in process. The things that you're talking about, how independence can make Scotland better, we weren't talking about that. But wasn't, we were talking, but we were wasn't having an independence, government. and it wasn't having, isn't having an independent supporting FM part of that package, or something we don't have in Wales. So oh, yeah, the, sure. In the sense that Blair was delivering socialism. I mean, leaders that represent a cause don't necessarily move a cause forward. And this is what I'm trying to say. You said over 50%. Actually, baseline support for independence has been more or less 47 48% all the way through. It's effectively 50-50. Yeah. We have never sustained over an extended period um, for more than about, I mean, we can talk about when this happened, for more than a, a, a period of maybe about six months we've never sustained over 50 percent. we keep coming back to that baseline we now seem to have a baseline of 47 and we ping up to 55 and then back down again and in between and whatever yeah but but don't i, I don't even believe that we are necessarily over 50 percent in the baseline so my point being if we're not explaining to people why independence is better for them and we are basically just relying on waiting for westminster to screw up and then saying giving us a referendum how do you consolidate um, support? How do you build support? And this is what's not been happening. And remember, you said two more years. We've been eight years under yeah. the Sturgeon strategy, and we didn't make any progress. Now, what had been happening was the promises were getting more. So you, what you had was this process where Sturgeon would then say, ah, but it's 18 months away now, because, yeah. and then she was going to hold it in 2018. Then she called it off in, two, in 2017. And then she said again in 2019, I ah, know the second we win an election, the, the UK general election, um, opposition to a referendum will melt away. So give us an overwhelming majority in this election. Now, of course, it didn't melt away. That was never realistic. But now she was cornered. So she promised to hold one in 2020. And then COVID fell out of the skies and excuse to not hold one. And then she promised that it would be 2021. Then it was 22. Then it was 23. 
Now, at this point, she's running out of time. There was no excuses to not hold this referendum. So now what she had to do was deliver it. But the problem was she was never in a position to deliver the referendum. So what they ended up doing was in a panic, and I can explain that if anyone's really interested, yeah. in a panic, they went to the Supreme Court. Yeah. Now, everyone in their dug knew the Supreme Court was going to say no. But, again, without going into this too much technical detail, they thought they could pass the legislation in the Scottish Parliament for a referendum bill and then be sent to the Supreme Court. That bought them another year. And that was beginning to be within the timescales where a lot of people thought that Sturgeon might leave. But what actually happened was her Lord Advocate said, this referendum bill is not legal. I am not going to permit you to bring it into the Scottish Parliament. So this thing that Sturgeon had been promising and promising, she just suddenly discovered in about April last year, April, May last year, that she was just going to, it was going to grind to halt. She wasn't even going to be able to bring a referendum bill in because her lawyer advocate wasn't letting her because it wasn't legal. So what they did was they preemptively went to the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court fast-tracked it and said no. That was it. That's the end of the whole line. She didn't have anything else. So what she did then was she announced that she was going to hold a de facto referendum at a general election, i.e. if we got more than 50% of the votes for the SNP cast in that election, they would call that a mandate for independence. Now, that was a crazy idea. Nobody supports it, really. And using the Westminster election is just about the worst way to do it. I mean, it's a UK-wide election. How can we have mm. a, a single-issue yeah. election in Scotland and a multi-issue election in England? And um, we've got incredibly strong support among young people now. But our franchise is 16, votes at 16, and the UK's votes at um, yeah. 18. And that was going to cut off about 300,000 of our, I think that's right from memory, of our key voters. It was a terrible idea and it didn't have support. And so she didn't know what to do. And so she said, wait, we're going to have a conference to discuss this. And that was supposed to be coming in March. Right, but the okay. problem was, by mid-January, senior figures in her party who are known for their loyalty and who'd never rebelled in their life had all said, this is a crazy idea stop. Now, she was going to get turned over at that party, very vis at that conference, very visibly and very publicly. And I understand completely why she wouldn't want to have done that. Sturgeon's never been heftily turned over on a policy before. She's ruled by decree largely, and it would have been difficult for the way that she governs to have dealt with that. So that's one strand of it. Another strand is, it is really difficult to explain how badly everything in is going in, Scot in the Scottish government. I mean, it, it's, like, it's like the reverse Midas. Everything they touch falls apart. So right now, they've tried to introduce a National Care Service bill and literally every single stakeholder barring private care homes, social work department, the local authorities, care working unions, everybody has said, this is absolutely awful. You must stop it and think again. Three of the parliamentary committees with majority government members on it have savaged the bill. And that's just a random one. The NHS is in a desperate state. Today we've discovered that the, the deadline for a deposit return scheme, so in Scotland we'll have to pay 20 pence extra for every bottle oh, yeah. of anything, but we get the 20 pence back when we return yeah. it. And there's been this, the industry has been warning that it's ill-prepared and it's not going to work. Today, um, but it's a green minister that's leading that. And the Green Minister was swearing, no, everything's good to go. Don't believe the propaganda. We're fine for an August launch. The deadline for for producers to sign up is next week. Today, it turns out it's illegal. They knew it was illegal. They oh. had to ask from derogation from the UK Single Market Act to do this. And they hadn't actually contacted Westminster to ask for that yet. And Westminster today says, well, we're not giving you it. So the legislation's dead, and they've been working on it for three years. My, so, mind you, that does sort of prove the point of independence. But um, it does, it does, but but also proves that that that, that the Scottish government's not it. competent. It's prepared. I could just keep going. There's literally nothing that's going well. Not a sick. I, I just spoke <laughs> to somebody about this, and I said, "I'm." It wasn't this one. It was another one. I'm going yeah. on a podcast. Could you give me an example of two things that are going well in government, so I don't sound overwhelmingly negative? Now, this person that I was speaking to is not as pointed his mean in criticism yeah. and he stopped and he paused and he waited about 15, 20 seconds. He says, no, I don't think I can. And that's a reasonable, calm, yeah. non-McAlpine type person. Right, so government's going dreadfully wrong and it's getting worse and worse and the budget, the budget cuts are going to be brutal. And finally, on top of all this stew, 
You've got to remember how difficult, I mean, the, the, the movement's divided, there's bitterness yeah. everywhere, everyone's arguing, but you've got to remember one other key thing, which is that the police came and saw her the week before she left to say that they are escalating the investigation into fraud on the part of her and her husband to a full-scale investigation. Peter Murrell will be investigated, will be interviewed under caution, and it's likely that charges may follow. It's hard right. to get so this looks like a thing. real dog's dinner, which may be... So why, why would Atlanta. somebody want to go and get out of this? I can understand. I thought she was probably going to leave before the summer recess, yeah. and I thought she would engineer a gentle exit. But I can see she didn't want to go to a conference, and she certainly doesn't want to be First Minister and having her husband interviewed under caution by the police. So it's an ugly set of events. And I've been surprised, because while I did predict what was going to happen... Yeah. Um, I did also say the one thing that she won't do is leave under a cloud without a job to go to and sit on the back benches for three years. And nominally, that's not what happened. I don't think anyone thinks she actually will sit on the back benches for three years. But that's okay. sort of what's happened. So that's why we've got to where we are. That's why okay. we've dived into this. And it's important to say that everyone was caught in the hot by the, the pace of this. Right. Okay, And yeah, that's well... why everyone's been scrambling to put together a leadership campaign, and that's where we are now. Right. Okay. Well, thanks for explaining that. Um, that to me sounds like very bad news for the SNP as a party, and by implication, then to the independence movement because they're the biggest pro-independence party, and you know, they have the the structure and everything to deliver on independence. So we'll come to that in a minute. Yep. I'd like to just discuss a bit more about the the three candidates, which we now has been confirmed. There's only three candidates, if I'm right. To, so. There's Ash Regan, I'd never heard of her, or Kate Forbes, mm -hmm. or Hamza. I had heard of Hamza Yusuf, of course. So maybe if you get a, what I'm getting from Twitter is Ash Regan is you know, the, the the Alba candidate, <laughs> Kate is you know the Christian old SNP candidate, mm -hmm. and Hamza is you know the the Sturgeon, the, the voice of Sturgeon in a, in another in another in another suit. So. Am I right on it? Am I watching, following the right Twitter people? You're you not me. million miles away. Right, okay. That. <laughs> um, let me put it like this. The, the and who is best for independence? So we'll come to that. Aye, okay. The, yeah. the easiest one to answer there is Hamza. Right. I mean, he's very openly saying, I'm the continuity candidate, nothing will change. Right, okay. He's backed relentlessly by the party machine. Um, for those that don't know, I mean, I think this has been outrageous. Um, it is. Nicola Sturgeon's husband who's counting the votes and setting the rules. I mean, it is mad. Right, okay. I mean, it is, it's mad. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. One of the candidates actually said that she will ask him to leave if elected, and he's still counting the votes. It's mad. There's no, there's no independent scrutiny of this voting process. They have, what they also did was they gave people about four days notice, no, they get about a week's notice to get nominations in. Yeah, that's very short. Well, no, it's, I mean, it's all been, this is what I'm trying to say. Everything's, now I say this, <laughs> try to be neutral here. The max conditions are being set, yep. which maximally favours candidates with name recognition and yep. machinery behind them. It has been designed as a beauty contest. Now, it also should be noted that Kate Forbes is currently on maternity leave. Oh, I didn't know that. Right, so she's trying to do this while nursing a young baby. And... Despite the fact there's only two weeks of, well, there's three weeks of campaign and then the voting over, opens. And in two of those weeks, SNPHQ has just scheduled eight hustings. Inverness, the Borders, Edinburgh, Glasgow, right? So Kate Forbes is now, I mean, it's it's hard to feel, personally, I find it hard to feel that that's not designed specifically to really mess with Kate Forbes. I actually mess with her well-being. She's just going to have to drag a, a nursing child mm. around eight Oh, every bit of Scotland, she lives in Sky. It's not exactly a quick trip home for her. Oh, God. So you'll, you'll yeah, Scotland's to... big. For people in Wales, Scotland's a very big country. You know, we we, yeah. we go up there and we say, God, this is it's like poets times three times. You know, just 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 so just folk in Wales get a sense of how vastly empty Scotland is. Yeah, um, we've got a local authority in Scotland, right? A local it's authority bigger than Wales, probably bigger than Belgium. <laughs> We've got a way. Of, no, it's the, really I, mad. Yeah, I know. Hi, Hi, the Highlands and Islands Council is bigger. Actually, Highlands Council is bigger than Belgium. So, so it's, it's a very big. That, and we're not we're, desperately well populated for no, reasons you no, probably no. know. So Hums is absolutely a continuity character okay. candidate. 
beyond that, it's, I'm, I'm struggling. I'm, I'm trying to be open-minded, but I'm struggling to understand what the point of that is. So what's his pitch? Vote for me, everything will be exactly the same, despite the fact that your predecessor has just said something has to change because we've hit a deadlock, so therefore yeah. I'm going. So that's fairly straightforward. Hamza's basically taken continuity sturgeon position at the moment. Right, then we come to Kate Forbes. This is a slightly more complicated one. Kate Forbes isn't really old SNP. Um, in the sense that you said old SNP. Yeah, I'm just and, paraphrasing people on Twitter. So, you know. Yeah, she's not even what I would call religious SNP. Mm. She's more from the, um, what I would call, kind of uh, business-orientated part of the SNP. Okay. So she is closer or to she was a she she worked in accountancy and was so she's a Christian Democrat in, in um, terms. Let's let's set aside the Christian bit for a second. Right, yeah, right, okay. for, and we'll yeah. come back to the Christian bit in a second because no, no, I mean, I mean most Christian Democrat parties aren't particularly Christian by now. I mean, yeah, no, but she is. That's my point. Yeah, so okay. the Christian <laughs> yeah. bit you can separate the Christian, but you can't talk about Kate Forbes without talking about that. Right, okay. But that isn't really defining her politics. That's the point. She's not. She she. Her political stance is much more shaped by her business um, right, okay. approaches. But on top of that, she's also considered to be a very bright, very capable young woman. She's young. She's yeah. only in her early 30s. Uh, very bright, very, very capable young woman. And she's been great at indicating that she wants to open up. So okay. she's been saying, I want to open government up. The, the Sturgeon ran a very tight, very closed government. And she's saying, I want to work with others. So... I'm I've got I I'm keeping quite close contacts with the Forbes campaign. I'm absolutely open minded about it. Yep. She said lovely things about Commonweal, said that lots <laughs> of her left wing policy work she's really interested in pursuing. Yep. So I see her as a, a change candidate, right. but her change is to get away from the kind of um progressive liberal posturing and move towards a more muscular governmental agenda. I would I would kind of paraphrase okay. it. But she is also the child of religious missionaries. And it's not oh, just religion, it's yeah. it's, it's the wee free church. The, so okay. the, the, the free church of Scotland is quite extreme. So the, what, what her team did was, they got her All to principled in their views. Sorry? All principled. Well, they, I mean... They, you know, it depends they're, how they're, you phrase it, isn't it? You can, but it's... It's even principled extreme, so it's they're still okay. kind of like no 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 fairies on a Sunday. Literally, no fairies should be moving on a Sunday. Right, okay. They they don't believe in um they don't believe definitely don't believe in gay marriage. They they don't believe in obviously any of the transgender rights stuff. But yeah. I mean, she was actually on television at the start of the campaign saying that for her having children out of wedlock is wrong. This is quite yeah. This is quite far end. Out of this step is, with um. It's it's not Church of Scotland. No. <laughs> right, so no, no. what I've kind of argued with this is that um, I don't believe that her fundamental political positioning derives from her religion. I think they're more coincidental than anything. Her political positioning has got more to do with her business backgrounds okay. than her politics. She's just, I would describe her as a business orientated figure who happens also to be religious rather than a Christian Democrat. And I mean, if she so said, look, I'm going to park all the bills, you know, just recognise there's, there's gay marriage and everything, just park that. You know, I didn't agree with it personally, but it's done. I'm moving on. Mm -hmm. I mean, she could strategically get away with that. Presume, and a lot of people say, fine, as long as we don't, we don't go back and try and rewrite those laws or whatever, even if they could in Scottish Parliament. Uh, maybe... It's a, it's a as a political strategist, I would argue it's sustainable, but don't get yeah. yourself on it's easy. We've yeah. had a big experiment in this in UK politics. He was called Tim Farron, and it didn't work. It is yeah. much more difficult than people think to be a socially conservative leader of a socially progressive party, just because in the modern world, values, inverted commas, yeah. are just seen as such a key part of what people expect. Yes. And, and if you're if you're a party which has really built up its image as being liberal, open, you know... Well, it, and it, the independence we want, to be honest. Isn't it? Love is love and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. It becomes quite hard. So you think that'd be, you know, so although she could say, okay, we're going to park that, I'm not going to go down the re-looking re at, you know, 
people's relationships and stuff. Really. That's done. That's parked. It's over. You think that her lead in the party could be difficult because in the future there could be another issue comes up in this kind of situation. Well, well, she's yeah. asked, or well, she's asked to speak in a rally or something. Yeah, or... yeah. no, she yeah. will. Do you know? You know the you know the um story about a uh, Harrison Ford and talking to George Lucas about his script for Star Wars when they were filming it. No, and well, no, it's it's one of my favorite things. I play. <laughs> I just I say this so much. Right. Um. Harrison Ford looked at his script, which was dense with Lucasisms about spacey this and parsecs that. Right. And Harrison Ford said, um, George, you can maybe type this shit, but you sure as hell can't see it. So right. you can tell me yeah. that a leader can go on television and say, yes, but I'm going to step back yeah. and not get... But they're still on television saying I'm at anti-abortion. You can write it but delivering it is really difficult. Now, that said, I do want to be clear that I don't actually know Kate Forbes, but I know quite a lot of people who know her, and I'm interested in the fact that everybody but everybody that I know who knows her says she's they, they really like her. She's right. warm, she's kind, she's generous, she's involved. Is that a good thing in politics? I mean, because you need to have an ego mm -hmm. in politics, uh, because basically, if you don't have an ego, you're going to be battered down. Yeah, and this, is, this is Salmon's big strength. He, he has a huge ego. And you just need that because the world is unforgiving if you're leader of a political party. Yeah, but we've just been through two leaders with giant egos. And the truth is, they don't have a third one. This is just be clear about this. What you suggest is not an option. They, Sturgeon did not allow egos to come through in her administration. Egos were severely punished. And so we don't have that. We don't have a big leader. We are working with three people who are not Sturgeon or Hums or... or Sturgeon or um, Salmon. Does Salmon come back? Yeah, no, I mean... We, we'll go to Salmon later. Uh, Salmon, we'll so, go to the history. We'll discuss Salmon later. later. So, so, okay. Right. So then let's move on to Ash. So Ash, I should, aim, I should again here disclose... That so Forbes is an intelligent person. She's yep. uh, diligent. She has uh, uh, values or whatever. Uh, she's she's saying a lot of the right things, but she's right. got this giant, giant right. okay. Achilles heel. And, and you think that the problem with that is basically the party and the country itself is sort of left a son to this and you got someone who's not... Well, it's a, also, a, she's been absolutely monstered by yes. SNP loyalists. And right. I've got to say, I think it's been horrible. Right, the, okay. the, the, the one thing you can say about Kate is she holds her beliefs privately and does not evangelise them. And I, whether you disagree with them or not, I am not happy with the way she's been treated. Some of the stuff that we've been said about her in the last two weeks is absolutely horrible. And I keep coming back to this. This is a whatever you say, this is a young woman, one of your colleagues, who is currently nursing a newborn and is young and the one of the part a part of the future of that party. And the way that she's been destroyed as a person, not just as a candidate, I, I find horrible. So I just wanted to say that I don't know, Kate, but. I'm almost rooting for her the way that things have gone against her in the last. Um, in the but last things year. would be very tough if she could. If but she it will be. Come leader and, it will you know, still be hard to pull off. But that is an excuse, but that's just like. Okay, so on to Ash Regan again, a name I literally never heard of. No, now this one is. And I didn't even know if it was man or woman when I heard the name. No. Something I had. So. so, just to be. um, uh, Just for another disclosure, I worked with Ash. Ash worked for Commonwealth. Right, okay. All so right, okay. Was, it was Commonwealth staff Um, just after the referendum. Ash is. I mean, she was a government minister, but she's not. She's not fresh off the boat. She was five years, she was community safety minister and did a lot of you know good things. She's worked at the heart of government. She's not completely new. But, I mean, under, again, in the Sturgeon administration, folk didn't even know what some of the cabinet ministers looked like. You know, there, was, there wasn't an awful lot of promotion of new, wider talent. Yeah. So, so ministers don't get on telly. Ministers don't get seen very much. Ash's position is, I mean, how to put this? You could you just called it the Alba candidate. I would describe it more as the um can't we go back to before Alba and the SNP split candidate. Right, okay. So yes, she's oh I should no, sorry, I should also start off by saying the thing that propelled Ash into this is the fact that she took a principled stance and actually resigned over the gender recognition act. But so, against it. So we've got there was a this has all been hastened by another factor which has gone desperately wrong, which yeah. is there's a very, very controversial, or highly contested, shall we say, piece of legislation went through the Parliament at the end of the year to enable um, self-ID for trans um, people. Yeah. But 
it was also, how can I put this? There was a quite a dogmatic refusal to take amendments. So, for example, an amendment was put forward to say yes, but not, not people convicted of violent sexual crimes against women. Yeah. If you've got a violent sexual crime against a woman, transitioning to a woman is probably a bit of, it's a bit of a red flag. Or for another one that was put forward was you can't just transition after you've been charged with a crime and then right. go to the state of a woman's prison after you've been charged with a crime. Just about, those yeah. were all rejected. So it was a very, yeah. very far end version of the legislation. Right, okay. Ash resigned over this. She's gender critical. She's not socially <clears throat> conservative. She's just key it was very supportive in fact she's a key activist on gay marriage mm. but she's more on the gender critical side she's a feminist she's, she's coming from the feminist side so right. in that regard yes she's got that alba element as well but she her positioning on this is she's really the change candidate she wants to redemocratize the car party she wants to open up governments bring in more talent and are you working to, for the Ash campaign, Robin? I've, the, I've, the I've told you, I've, there's, there's two of the campaigns I'm staying in touch with and putting, <laughs> right, I'm okay. putting supportive messages into right, because okay. I'm not a party member and I'm I I am a, I work for a think tank that tries to influence everybody. Yeah. We've got two candidates have said lovely things about us, yeah. and so we're engaging with that, right. um, and that's why I'm trying to say full disclosure. I'm a pal of Ashes. I've known her for years, yeah. and I have said a few things. So, but but that's that's her pitch. Her she's, pitch is redemocratize the party, um, move past the kind of centralized, uh, messiah based model that we've had for the last two leaders, work with the independence movement, not against it. Sturgeon was very hostile to the non-party independence movement and the civic movement. She would never engage with it at all. In fact, she's quite openly distanced herself from it. Um, and, uh, and, and that's the sort of thing that Ash wants to reverse. But uh, the, the problem is, this problem that you've got, a lot of people don't know who Ash is. And remember that while the party machinery kind of swung in, in place for Hamza, so they've got quite a lot of professional operatives, both Key and Ash are operating with volunteers. It's a £5,000 yeah. limit for spending in this campaign. Oh, and, yeah. and remember that a week and a half ago, nobody thought this was coming. They had a week to prepare. Yeah, that, that is another question as well, because I mean, if you are going to become a leader... You know, and, spe and you would then become the FM, so it's not becoming the leader of a party yeah. not in power. That is an absolutely huge change of gear in your personal life, in the way you conduct yourself, in the way you have to deal with, with everything from your family to housing, uh, to personal security, but also just in with the way you're thinking. So you started 2023, think, oh, there you go, these are things to do for the mental list for the year, raise a baby or whatever, then all of a sudden, oh, become FM. And I am concerned about that because that's just such a huge change of gear. A lot of people wouldn't be able to cope with that change. Um, I mean, it would be a great uh, feather in the cap if they could. But I am concerned about that in terms of just as a, as a party, as a as a corporate body, having to deal with that kind of pressure as well. Well, let me start off by uh, offering Robin McAlpine's advice service, which right. is. If you are in any way enjoying your life, for the love of God, people, don't <laughs> become a political leader. It's a horrible yeah, job. Yeah. Don't become politi political at all. <laughs> don't, 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 don't do it. I was um, in my, as, as we've discussed, I was preparing for what came next, which I thought was going to be the summer. And I met with a senior SNP politician in uh, late January who I thought was a potential runner for this election. Yeah, okay. And I spoke to that politician, I remember the coffee and a chat, spoke to that politician about it and asked if they, I'm going to keep the genders here, there's not yeah. that many of them, yeah. if they were considering it and they said they'd rather have their legs sawn off than come in. It's not just that doing this job is hard work anytime, it's that they are coming into a shitstorm in, yes. in domestic government. So it's brave of anyone to step forward and yeah, doing this. No. I, and I'm, again, this is maybe going to have a degree of bias, but there is a suggestion that Humza was kind of like the, the, the joke along a lot of people is, oh right, he he lost spin the bottle then, did he? So they needed a okay. they needed a they needed a continuity candidate, but enthusiasm for this wasn't high. John Swinney seems to have said no, and Angus Robertson pulled out. Mm. Um so there is a bit of a suggestion that 
they were starting to say, Christ, Christ, Hamza, it's you. So um, it's not a great job, but it needs done. So um, I, I'm, I'm glad anyone stepped forward, to be honest with you. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, fixed now. well, it is, it is a huge job. So, okay, the SNP will take the vote by, well, it's now 27th of February 2023. So by the end of March. Nearly there, end of March. There's yeah. two weeks of voting, but um, the patterns in the past have suggested that more than half of the votes will come in the first 48 hours. Yeah. So effectively, the campaign's all but done in, uh, what was that, about a fortnight and Friday. It's ridiculously short amount of time, isn't I, it? I've, I've been really critical about this. It's been, it really has been about... And there's, no, there's also no need... Because it could easily have gone over a few months. Well, traditionally, the traditional rules were four months, and yeah, I've well, been, I've been, sense. I've been really trying to push this here that um, this is a crucial moment in the in the future of the SNP. Mm. The, the well, SNP, it's the future of Scotland. I am as well. The SNP hasn't had ten seconds to stop and ask itself, "What are we? Where are we going? Yeah. What are we doing in twenty years?" And this is the traditional break moment. And as I've been trying to point out, what people should have, and, and believe me, there's a lot of unhappiness at the grassroots because they're not getting a chance to mm. properly interrogate candidates. Um, I would have, if I was an SNP member, I would have want candidates to have time to sit down, consider yeah. their positions, their policy positions, their strategy positions, their campaign positions, meet people, talk to people, go out and, and start a bigger discussion than just pick me, pick me. But they've been forced into it, and I've been, I've been really try to hammer this um, if Biden hadn't had the primary processes and hadn't been pushed into more radical positions by Bernie Sanders mm. he would have nothing to talk about now everyone recognises that Biden is only really still alive because of three things that he only did because Sanders pushed him into it. that's the merit of an open debate in a party you get more than just a leader. You get a debate about who you are, what you are, and where you're going. And it should make you stronger if you do it properly. And the SNP's just been denied it. I think it's ridiculous. So in two weeks' time, it's, yeah, that's... it's, 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 it's chuck, your, chuck your vote in the, in the machine, hope Peter's counting it fairly, and then you'll be told <laughs> what you'll be told what's happening next, and that's it. So okay, so the so that's sort of the SNP. So in terms of the independence movement, which radio yes come Listeners and viewers on YouTube will be keen to get. I mean, so you have uh, two other pro-independence parties in Scotland, the Green Party, which are in government as well in Parliament, and you have Alaba, which is you know the the an examined spin-off, if you like. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you have, as you say, the 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 independence movement of which Commonweal and many other people and individuals are part of. So what happens? So you you feel so just to quickly go over what you feel the mistake was after. Brexit, you know, that Sturgeon said, okay, there's going to be a referendum. Mm -hmm. Briefly, go if you went back to what was 2016, what would you suggest after the Brexit vote? Or what no, was... no, go back. Go back after again. 2014. Okay. Anyway, we had this right. phenomenal momentum. In yeah. the space of about 18 months, two years, a, a, a massive, lively, energised, enthusiastic, exciting campaign effectively put itself together from nothing. Yeah. And afterwards, from immediately afterwards, we should have built and consolidated. And the house. Actually, well, just well I've got my little theory, Robin, that mm -hmm. radical movements, certainly here in Wales, my experience is, um, they, they're like butterflies. They, they're, they're very active. They're very pretty. They're very uh, energetic for about 18 months. Mm-hmm. And then people just burnt out. People get burned yeah. out. And then you get an integrity, people fall out, things happen. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult to carry that kind of momentum as you had in a referendum for more than another year. I mean, people people are just tired after yeah. the campaign. So how would you have con continued that? Well, after? first of all, you're absolutely spot on because I'm a bit in the manic side. Now I was bouncing about in late 2014, mm -hmm. talking to leading figures in the movement saying, listen, we've got to get things in shape now if we're going to shape what comes next. And they were all looking me in the eyes. He's going, oh, we're so tired. And I'm, I'm, I'm doing my Presbyterian Scott thing of, you don't get to be tired. <laughs> Everything's happening now. So you're absolutely right. One of the things which I keep trying to re reassure people about is, oh, but we don't have the activists we used to. No, nobody does. It's really hard to keep it going. I of get course. to do this for a living. Yeah. And it helps me to keep it going. And I'll tell you something. If I, if I wasn't doing it for a living, there's times when I would have taken six months. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And that's understandable. And you've got to appreciate that and accept that. 
build it into a part of a plan. So that's why you've got to build the connective membranes that, that mean that when you turn it back up again, yeah. there's something to absorb them again. And that's what hasn't happened. So again, uh, and this is not a, a, a view that's hard to sustain because it was written publicly. A number of Sturgeon's closest key advisors believed that the 2014 campaign was a mistake, that this whole grassroots, let a thousand flowers bloom yeah. movement had cost them the referendum, that we should narrow it right down and you labour it, triangulate everything right down to a small number of swing voters who were socially, who were economically conservative and that the SNP should part ways with the independence movement altogether. So I, 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 so, so they're unhappy that they don't think the referendum should be held at all in twenty fourteen. No, 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 they, no. no, no. In twenty fourteen, yeah, they ah. came out at believing that had they stuck to a purely triangulated new Labour type campaign, they'd have won. They'd have won. This is dribble. I mean, it's measurably dribble. But anyway, um, that was their firm belief. Now, this was actually uh, just so quickly, just because this is going to think how. how... What kind of creature that does that look like? What, how, what kind of legs does it have? The Growth Commission. Have you read the Growth Commission? Yes. It looks like the Growth Commission. Promise nothing, offer nothing, tell people it'll take 20 years of gentle pain before they get the gains of independence and then you'll get respect for being serious. All right, okay. Don't, don't, above all, don't piss off big financial institutions, big business. So, Start with the powerful, don't challenge them, right, okay. and then work your way backwards from that. That's what it was, the Growth Commission. So I remember I, I said that the, some of our closest advisors said this publicly. Well, one of the key ones, uh, you can go and have a look, I think it's in a sub stack or medium, I can't remember. Andrew Wilson, who who led the Growth Commission, kind of led that. He His, his typography for that was... Um, it's substance, not symbols. He thought that the 2000 campaign was all symbolism with a bunch of people running about saying happy, better world after independence and that that was all just pure symbolism and that it didn't have enough substance to persuade the public. Okay. But, he but that's not an unreasonable position to take, is it? I mean... Yeah, no, it's just be... wrong. Right. Why well, is it wrong, though? Because, I mean, I, I, Cause, he cause would I've done public attitude research work and he hasn't. Right. And he's not wrong. I mean, don't get me wrong. Yeah. Public attitude research work says that what people were missing was confidence we could deliver. He's right about that. Yeah. But what he's wrong about is they all said the only reason I even considered you was because you were offering something I really liked. Yeah. Okay. So it wasn't it wasn't do less to persuade them you can deliver it. It was do the things you just talked about, but persuade us you can do that. So, I mean, I said this at the Merlin Drafford conference. You can neither get someone to make a jump by telling them there's ice cream on the other side, but the crocodiles will get them, mm. or tell them to jump over and the crocodiles probably won't eat them. Right? So the first one, ice cream's not worth the chance of getting eaten. <laughs> right? So that you've not been reassured that your jump is a sensible jump because you're yeah. prepared because it's safe. And in the first one, well... Being told you probably won't hurt yourself isn't any good if there's no motivation for doing it. Yeah. So you need both motivation and reassurance. And what the Growth Commission read wrongly was that you could just look at the reassurance bit and not worry about the motivation bit. Right. There's yeah. also, incidentally, for those who don't, there's also another camp within um, uh, the independence movement who believes that the motivation must purely be pride and country. So it's about patriotism. Oh, right, okay. Yeah, yeah. Right. So you've got, I come from the independence for a purpose. I've always been a believer, I fundamentally believe, but independence yeah. for a purpose wing. Yeah. And then you've got the independence as a process wing. And then you've got independence as a as a an inevitable outcome of the nationalism and patriotism that people yeah. should feel wing. And those three wings have never resolved the differences over the years. And of course, Sturgeon's wing, the one in the middle. The process wing they were they were dominant and people like me got bundled off to do think tanks that produced policy work that the scottish government didn't really follow so that's that's been the dynamic behind the different strands of it so what happened was when they came in uh when Sturgeon took over she put up quite a big barrier between her and the independence movement and 
effectively the re for those that don't know um about the Murrell case, the reason that he's being um investigated by the police is because they raised six hundred thousand pounds for independence campaigning and then spent it on something else completely. Um, so they raised six hundred thousand pounds from the movement, including from non-party members, to be spent on a referendum they were promising was going to happen within the year. All right. Right. But then what happened was Sturgeon. This was in two thousand sixteen. But then what happened was Sturgeon cancelled the referendum, and they spent the six hundred thousand pounds on something else completely, and that's illegal. But the part of this that's why that's why charges are almost certain to come, and it's, it's spiraled since then. Half the SNP's audit committee resigned because they wanted to look at this and Peter Murrell was refusing to give the Finance and Audit Committee the accounts. I mean, it's ludicrous. No, no, it's pretty ugly. I mean, it's not, not, none of this is good. So, um, but the thing that people didn't quite, the thing that people don't quite understand is why did they raise £600,000 for a referendum they didn't know they were going to run? The answer is because there was a all-movement fundraiser that was being prepared and they just bed-blocked it. And they bed-blocked it by putting their own out, taking all the money away, for the movement, um, but they were doing, they did it at such a speed. I mean, literally, they did it in about forty eight hours. They did it at such a speed they never stopped to check the legals at the bottom. And the fundraising—it's so crazy because they could have got all the way with all of this if the sentence hadn't said this money will be spent on a referendum campaign, and they just said this money will be spent pursuing the cause of independence. Did they get away with it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. That's what I mean by the independence movement had its its access to money was more limited. Its access to power was completely limited. So you couldn't get Sturgeon symbolically snubbed the movement very visibly. So she refused to go in any of the big marches. No. Yeah, I, that's that is peculiar. Um, she wouldn't let she wouldn't let any of her senior ministers go near the marches. She briefed the media that the marches were against her will, and she wanted nothing to do with this. So, I mean, here in Wales, it's a different situation, of course. And, you know, Adam Price, from what I understand, there's some Plaid members in the Senate, in the Parliament, who didn't want him to speak in the first independence uh, march, march we had in 2019, which is the first ever really independence march we've ever, ever had, organised by all under one banner. Come, we saw a lot of support from the boys up in Scotland for that. Mm -hmm. Uh, because in Wales, a Plaid community were quite shy of using the word independence. But, you know, he went out on a limb and did it. It's, you know, yeah, it probably doesn't clash because of it. Is anyone disagreeing with that now? No, no. Right. So, I, I mean, if, I, I mean, and and I think that I mean, Pride hasn't gone up, you know, as much as uh, Pride people and Adam Price would expect it, but it certainly hasn't gone down. So that big bogey that talk about independence would lose vote actually hasn't happened. No. So, so we're clear, so that you all understand, and you'll all yeah. chuckle because I know that you in Wales, all of you in Wales, think that Sturgeon is the leader you need. Yes, <laughs> yeah. I'm very, I'm absolutely clear right. that Adam is the leader that we need in Scotland. Right. Precisely not because he's a big ego. He's not a salmon. He's not a sturgeon. At this stage, what we need is to build the infrastructure of an, a, a connected, concerted, collective movement. And to do that, you need an engaged leader. So again, you have no idea what it's like for me to turn up. At, I knew it was going to be there, but I was speaking yeah. at the Maitland Trafford. Yes. Um, conference on a on a panel with yeah. Adam yeah. and it was when I got there first thing and he's out having a coffee talking to delegates and the, do you, if, even if Sturgeon would come to a movement thing she'd come in in a limo five minutes before her speech she would demand a speech and she would leave five minutes yeah. afterwards You we it's this engagement this connected movement that we've not had yeah. that's okay. why we've become so fragmented and, and right. frankly, devised. There's there's a lot of bitterness in the camp in the movement now, which is hellish. Well, there's been a lot of bitterness in Wales as well. Oh, look, don't get me wrong. <laughs> yeah, it's everywhere. Yeah. I wrote yeah. a piece after my visit, just explaining how happy it makes me to go to Wales. Yeah, I saw it. But but listen, don't don't. Let, no, I'm not. No. I'm not. No, I, I, I know if I was down in Wales working on this for one year, <laughs> I'd be I'd be screaming and shouting at folk just like everyone else. It's, yeah. it's always tourism. It's it's lovely to go and do tourism into someone else's politics because yes, it always uh, looks better than yours. So yeah, well, I recognise that. Yes, and uh, but I think that yeah, it, it was good to see Adam there taking time the it's whole the day. Messaging. Yes, I mean, and messaging. he has the time. He doesn't have the the same kind of responsibility as Sturgeon has as well. And it's good also to see the the leader of the Green Party there as well. So I mean, no, it's uh, really positive. So, so, so yeah, it was a. It's sorry. the messaging of a. It's a messaging of a campaign that's united in its desire to work together towards change 
that is the is the is the key that we've been lacking. We've had bits working independently against each other. So how can I put this? I don't think it's possible to win independence on the basis of the the one big ego, the one the messiah figure. Yeah, and, and I'm really, really, I, I can't. I find it difficult to stress how how clearly idiotic this is. If I say things like, "Well, you know, of course it was um, civil rights was all Lyndon B. Johnston, and Indian independence was absolutely completely um, the Attlee government," and uh, it was the clerk who woke up one morning and decided to bring an end to, <laughs> yeah. to bring an end to a party. So you need a mass movement. So the point people, of these is, in of every course. occasion, the purpose of a politician is to sign the bit of paper, which uh, is the result of mass yeah. effort, and it's not just mass movement. I, I keep wanting to say to people, never look at this narrowly. It's everything. It's circumstances, it's social attitudes, it's mass movement and activists, it's people who are not activists but institutions who realise things aren't right or are wrong, it's um, the tone of international communities. Social change is deep and rich and complex. It's never simple and it's never a straight line and it's never the gift of an individual person. I mean, never. I've been challenging people on my uh, website if you're interested in Scottish politics, you can have a look at my take on it at robinmcalpine.org. I'd said to people, um, tell me if I'm wrong, email me an example of social change, major so lasting social change that's down to one person. No, but people also will latch on to a figure as being an embodiment of a movement because people don't go into details. They don't. A lot of people just don't take the interest don't, in the whole not detail. 60, not 60%, they won't. Okay. So let's That's go in. That's my yeah. point. You can okay. you can creep just either side of fifty percent on the bit back of one big charismatic politician. We've we've had that with both Sam and who got over the that majority. Well, didn't quite, but and you've you've got it from Sturgeon who's just been under it. But um it's very, very rare, particularly in a Western democracy, to find one person that you can eat sixty. That's the point. Yeah. That's so I mean point. just these five people to be pissed off with the first minister over the health service. And you lose your referendum. It's it must be about more than one person. It's not. A, it's you need. Um, this is not anti politics. No, 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 you no. Need no. The, you need the politicians there to make the mechanisms work to sign it off to to. to but I mean, the message with the, the letter maybe for, with Salmon was he was looking from the outside. He was brave and took a big punt. I, when when you had the referendum, I was up in twenty thirteen. I thought. Heavens, this looks like a Plaid Cymru event. That is not very good. You know, mm -hmm. few people turned up in the well, a gig could be organised by the Cymru right, the Welsh Language Society here, with a couple of people not too sure when starting, and so we're not really taking the money, and then, oh, heavens, are they going to be absolutely crushed in a year's time? Mm -hmm. Things turned around. But, I mean, so to take that, you needed a, a big ego. You needed someone with that confidence to take on an independence, because I thought you were going to crush. I, I couldn't believe where the hell you're doing this now. But you came close, but so I think you do need that kind of person. This is maybe we, we touched oh, no, on I mean, I'm, different. Don't get, me wrong. don't get me wrong. The candidates social, now, because you need social, someone to prove that. You need someone with that. Social change often requires, and it can be one person, to take a leap of faith and a burst of courage. Yeah, and you look at but Zelensky you're absolutely, in Ukraine. You're absolutely right that if it had been just that, we'd have crashed and burned. Yeah. The I, I would suggest that certainly five, six, seven percentage points of that were added by everything but the SNP. So the radical independence movement, the mass canvassing in low-income neighbourhoods, yeah. we, this is what I was talking about, and uh, Andrew um, Wilson not being right about this, it is absolutely nail home that the lower down the socioeconomic ladder you get, the higher the likelihood of voting for independence until you get to you get to poor schemes, uh, housing schemes, and outside of the Orange Rangers vote, you, you, you're, you know, I, I did meetings, I did 230 public meetings during the NDF, so I, I could tell you everywhere what the turnouts were like. Yeah. And, and you know, we were doing meetings in Easter House of 250, 300 people standing remotely in halls. That was not, I never saw any of the senior SNP people there. It was, the, I mean, Commonweal wasn't accidental. It was because it was all going, I mean, I designed Commonweal with about 18 months to go, a bit more than that, 
precisely because it really was dull. There really was nothing exciting happening. And they said, we can't win this without the excitement. Yeah. That's 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 why common... But inspired people in Wales as well. So you've got to inspire, you've got to do all these things. And then you've got, and then you've got women for independence and you've got business for Scotland and you've got pensioners for yes and you've got NHS for yes, lawyers for yes. And it was that mass that created the momentum. Now, we would have got, I think, 38 points, 36, yeah. 37, 38. That looks, that looks one third, two thirds, not 50. Oh, yeah, 50. yeah, yeah. So, and I, that last push was it. So, you're right. We didn't do this without Salmond. I'm no, I'm not a Salmond fanboy. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, I'm, the fact that I'm a sturgeon critic doesn't mean I'm a Salmond fanboy. Yeah, yeah. But he was strategically much more adept than Sturgeon. Sturgeon's a great tactician. She's very good at making advantage, taking advantage of events that happen. Salmon was much more of a, a what I think they call in America weather makers. He was yes, much more well, like yes. to cause an event to happen yeah. by an intervention. And he did. Yeah. But without the without the movement coming in behind that that did, it might have crashed and burned. If it wouldn't have caught momentum. So that's what we've got to do. We've got to recover that momentum. We've got to recover. How do you do that? I mean, we, in ways, we've, when we started Yes Company back into 2015, people were going, well, you know, why, why are you having Yes Company? There's no referendum in the horizon. Who, what are you going to canvas for? And we said, we just really need to make the case for independence. And even if it's just 300 of us, someone has to have that on the political spectrum. And I think that's paid off. Um, this see, it's also, I mean, what it's are also, you... It's so also it's also a misreading. This this right. is another thing that drives me up the wall. I mean, this seriously, this is of all the things that have been a bane of my life uh, since 2014. The most irritating of them all is, yeah, but we need the referendum so we can start to change opinion. Now, here's me looking you in the face and saying, have we only ever had four changes of opinion in Britain since the war? <laughs> because... Opinion says, I mean, the one that I keep giving an example of when people try to explain, yeah, but but we never had a referendum on battery hens' eggs and free range eggs. That was a social change that came from campaigners and it took time. Yeah. They campaigned for it. And nowadays, free range eggs are the norm. I mean, mm -hmm. you, you, you know, it's, it's just the attitudes changed. This idea, no, no, what you do need, what you do need is you need to have her points to make people reconsider, right? So you can talk for ages. Humans do tend to firm up and formalize um, their opinions. That This is just straightforward um, decision-making strategy. They tend to formalize their opinions when they're getting close to having to make a decision. So yeah. it just clarifies the minds. So, but you can, you can do that in different ways. There's different ways to put, push people to a decision point. So I'm not suggesting we start putting the foot in their door and saying this offer is only lasting for another um, three days, so you better sign up now. But but that's, I mean, sales, yeah. marketing, people, political strategy, political campaigns, they have means of getting around this. And this is what I've really tried to, I mean, this is my area. I'm a political strategist. Um, I just, I'm just evangelical about the power of peer-to-peer -peer opinion changing. When right. you okay, so peer to peer models, you don't yeah. need a referendum, you can get going immediately. That's what we need to do. And just so that, again, just so that people understand this, everything that's the problem in Scotland at the moment is we're basically in a dead heat, it's basically 50 50. And at 50 50, we will never deliver independence, we will never yeah. deliver a referendum because there's no pressure in the Westminster to do so. We've got 50 percent, they've got 50 percent, dead heat, move on. Yeah. If we do not have the settled will of the Scottish public, say 60%, sitting around about 60%, even if we consolidated the 55% hard and kept it there mm. and not gone back down again, um, we would have had the material to start to put real pressure on Westminster for some sort of mechanism for resolving this referendum or whatever it would be. We will not do that from 58%. Okay, so... so... I keep saying to people... We don't need sixty percent to win a referendum. We need sixty percent to get a referendum. And yes, and I, and I think, and I think this is where what the the Brits, the Tories, and Labour are sort of saying. You know, it's a once in generation or whatever. That's totally rubbish because democracy changes, people's views changes. But I do think there is something there about, as you say, fifty percent 
in the polls isn't quite strong enough. You, I think I think I think I think the people in the country need to feel they're being disenfranchised and that the the, the majority, the solid majority, want change. And I think until that happens, then I think. You know, the, the Tories and Labour can get away with saying, you know, this is the Wenshin generation, you have to wait another 10 years or whatever. It's not just it's not just the before. I would strongly argue, strongly argue to everybody. But see, I'm, <laughs> it's the joy of working for a think tank. I get to take long views in this way. Mm. And we've done a lot of work about how Scotland would work after independence. And it's crucial that it works after independence. If you have independence and you get go through a, a rough 10 years, in the more that you, you can do that if you're Slovenia coming out of the Soviet Union, you can't do that if you're Scotland as a developed economy. If you want your country to succeed after independence, everyone must feel win or lose that okay, look, I lost or you know, I won. You can't have the the you know, that way that Remainers after Brexit yeah. never really believed it was a legitimate vote. No. Well, that was because it was too narrow. I do laugh at this idea that it was because folk told lies during the campaign. Really? Politicians <laughs> telling lies during a campaign? I couldn't believe yeah. it. So, okay, so I mean, um, so I'm still trying to work out then what the strategy is for the independence. Because, okay, I'm going to say this. It looks pretty bad for the independence movement no, in Scotland. No, no, no. no. Right. What you're doing there is, <laughs> it's, it's the, I don't know how to phrase this. It is the inverse reflection of you having thought it's been going well. Right, okay. It You're wasn't listening. going well. It's not going badly. Right. It is it's not been going. It's been free. It's not been going anywhere. It's been more right, or less yeah. frozen. So, number one, I'm a political strategist. Yeah. I am going to say straight off, my opinion of things doesn't really matter. What right, matters okay. is something that demonstrates whether I'm roughly right or wrong. That's why public attitude research works is important. So I might think that the next 10% of the no vote is soft, but I I need some evidence for that if I'm going to base my life on it. Yeah. And the answer, so we did public attitude research work. Now, there's a few things here which immediately tell you that, yeah, I'm really confident. So, number one, I mean, it's hard, to, like I say, it's hard to see how bad things have been going, but we now seem incapable of dipping below 50, 46, 47%. I mean, really yeah. bad things have happened, but that seems to be a baseline now. And it really does seem that once people have actively come over to independence, they don't go back. There's okay. very little evidence of going backwards. Because this is my concern. I mean, I, I, I want I want to hear more from you, but I mean, sure. this is me my punt then. You know, before the devolution referendum here in Wales in 1979, which we, was horrible for us, but, you know, you had a majority sometimes for devolution. Once the referendum came, it went down to 25%. We had majorities in 97 for, you know, we passed there with 6,000 votes. You know, mm -hmm. Literally, it's like, uh, which, which has passed. So, I mean, so when people say, oh, we're on 47 now, there's nothing inevitable that it would go up. I mean, it could nope, go there's down. Nothing, there's nothing inevitable that will stay standing. You're, see that inevitability but going up? I mean, I, I remember I told you the bane of my life. There is an assumption in the independence movement that you add 15 points during every referendum. And I'm like, oh, for goodness yeah, no, sake, no, just stop no. and think about that. Just right, start, if we, if I'm we, glad to hear if, you say that. No, but I mean, just stop and think about it. If we hold five referendums, do we get 100% of the vote? <laughs> I mean, it just okay. doesn't even make sense. So, I mean, so no, you can't. But, the other thing but I, my I point to... is, you can lose. I yeah. was worried we were going to. But all the evidence says that we've got a solid 47%. But the evidence also says that I'm right about the next 10% being soft. We did a whole sequence of focus groups and a big opinion poll on it. And, I mean, I can go into this in some detail if you want, but I'm, I'm maybe too much detail for on here. I'm going to some detail. Well, basically, what basically ten, the ten percent of no voters who seem to be softest yeah. after our yes votes, they profile in almost every way much more like yes voters than no voters. So right, you've got effectively you've got a third who are ten percent yes. of the population now, or ten percent yeah. of the no vote. Um, ten per, it would there's ten percent each points to play for, which, right, which okay. decide between fifty and sixty. Fine, okay, right, the. It's not. It's not that. It's not that precise a science. I can't tell you precisely no, numbers. No, I can no, only give you no. the indications. Yes. So, what that group look like, and again, we've tested this directly with them. They look like independence people who never quite got across the road. Not. Yeah. So there's about a third hardcore indie. They'll vote indie, and a matter of principle, even if they were told it was going to lead to 
a financial crisis and still vote yes. No, hardcore yeah. nationalists. You've got the same on the other side, about a third who vote for the union, even if it means we're, yeah. we, we have to live with Boris Johnson forever. And there's about 30% in the, oh, there's about 40% in the middle, of which, again, they're breaking nearly 50 50, something like that. Um, but the, so what the, what's crucial is that the, twin, the first 10% on the other side look like that 20% of the middle group on this side. So right. the way that I try to phrase this, how does, do we win independence, win independence? There's this belief that there is a group, a consistent group somewhere in Scottish society that if we could just get them, we win. It's pensioners. It's uh, it's above in average income, middle class, small C conservatives. Yeah. It's rural Scotland. It's the borders, whatever. N none of this is really true. We win this on the basis that there is a very large proportion of people in Scotland who profile precisely like peers who voted yes. So you get you know you take two women, same gender, same, so the same friends, the same same friends, same job, same age, same income spectrum, same part of the country, and one of them made it over the line and one of them didn't. Yeah. And it's getting the one that didn't make it over the line. So it's the closest. It's the peers, it's pulling the peers of those who made it over. And we know roughly why they didn't come over. This was the importance of focus groups. So we did focus groups with um, six focus groups. There were between eight and 10 participants. Focus groups aren't perfect, but they're, yeah, yeah. there's only so many ways you can gather qual quantitative, in sorry, qualitative information. Quantitative information is easy. You just ask lots of people and you count up what they said. But to get... Why they said it, you need qualitative. And there's no great way to do it. So we did focus groups. We did six of them and all over Scotland. And it was soft no's, soft yeses and undecideds. And we were doing this. It was a university that did it for us. And we had the, the facilitators deliberately not chasing for answers. So it was, right. it was to let participants voice their own views. But there was one woman in one group. I, I, I wasn't at them, but I looked over all the transcripts. There's one woman in one group, and the, 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 the facilitator couldn't stop. After the fifth time that she said, but I feel so guilty, the facilitator couldn't not ask her a follow-up question. She said, that's the fifth time you've said that you feel utterly guilty for voting. No, why? And she explained her reasons. She says, look, I'm a social Democrat. I really loved what the Yes campaign was offering. And incidentally, seeing all our focus groups, the knowest of the knows was a businessman from Hoyk. He hated the no campaign and he was really positive about the yes campaign. Okay. Even the knowest of our knows, yeah. like the positivity, the idea that things could be better, the involvement of ordinary people, young people, all that stuff. Yeah. But the problem was he wasn't convinced we could deliver and it was the same with her. Or more specifically, what she said was, my youngest has just graduated and he's got a job in the private sector. My eldest graduated four years ago and has now got a stable job in the public sector. We've just paired off our mortgage. I was just nervous about what might happen. And the guy goes, this facility says, yeah, but that's perfectly fine. I mean, that's a perfectly acceptable position. Why yeah. do you feel so guilty? And her words, this is how we win independence, in my opinion. I said it right there. I was sitting with three other strategy experts, polling read, yeah. poll reader and, uh, and other um, strategists. And I instantly said, we've got to bottle this and we win. Because what she'd said was, this was my problem. If we don't change, how do we get better? That was that was the sentiment that was pushing this next 10% towards crossing the line. If we've got to up that, if we don't change, how do we get better? And then we've got to take the barriers away. And the barriers are all down to how they perceived our ability to deliver. And that is all down to the fact that we've done no preparation. We haven't got coherent work in borders. Well, this is not true. We do have the coherent work, but the, but the Sturgeon leadership refused to acknowledge it. She didn't like it. So we need coherent work in borders that explains how it's going to work. We need internal UK market. How are we trading? We need defence. We've done a lot in that as well. We need currency sorted out. We need simple explanations of things like, how do you set up a Coast Guard? Now, most people are, aren't passing their general day thinking, oh, God, independence. I'm worried about the Coast Guard. Oh. Right? That's not the point. Well, the point Coast is, Guard people are. But the point is, if one person says, and if you've got the Coast Guards ready, and you go, oh, fuck Coast Guards, <laughs> you're not yeah. ready. 
So yeah. be ready. I mean, that's basically my take, and it's been it. I mean, I wrote an entire article on this in the 19th bleary eyed in the 19th September, a day after the referendum, saying, folks, here's the tasks that we've got. We have to understand that our case had holes because, understandably, we were propelled into this with about a year and a half's notice. Yeah. We couldn't, you can't do everything in a year and a half when you're running a campaign. We need to fill the holes. And we need to do that, not because the Scottish public's particularly interested in credit ratings, international and national credit. It's because they want somebody to reassure them that someone's yeah. got it. It's right. very often an excuse. They want to feel intelligent asking these questions, I think. And they ask it's, these it's a proxy. People keep asking, yes, did proxy, we lose right. it because people keep asking, did we lose it because of currency? I said yes, no. Yeah. Yes, no. We lost it because of currency, but it's not because people had a view of what our currency should be. It's because they said, what are you doing? And we said, Sterling Union. And when the other side said, we're not giving you one, they said, what's your plan B? And we went, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. We bluffed and they looked at So quickly, what is your currency plan? Because so can, something just got no question. You've just got, there's only two currencies options that you can ever conceive of. Formal currency union or have your own currency. That's it. So you go for so, the Scottish pound. We've got no option. Westminster will not give us a formal currency union. I don't think it would be good for us anyway. And we can't join the euro in time. Those are the only two currency unions open to us. We have no option. We must be able, bluntly, we must be able to quantitatively ease because that's now how Western governments deal with crisis. They quite, I mean, we couldn't, we, Scotland would have collapsed during COVID. We'd have gone, we'd have been an IMF for emergency. That's so would everyone else. So. No, no. If they couldn't quantitatively ease, but everyone else did quantitatively Yes, ease. yes, yes. If we couldn't, because we were using sterling informally, we were in so much trouble. We cannot. There is no option. If you're going to be independent, you need a currency. End of story. That's it. End of story. Okay, so so you need to prepare. Uh, you get the arguments out. Do you think you've got an idea where the next or 10% to get you a 60% is? Yeah, and the motivating is the other part. But like I say... We have to motivate people using peer-to-peer -peer techniques. It's not about barking. What's, what's that posh word for saying talking to people? Yeah, but in a controlled way. And it's not just right. it's not just talking. It's about not talking down at people. So I, I keep, right, okay, this, this is, again, yeah. for those of the slightest interest in this, this is the biggest change in campaign theory that I've seen in my lifetime, which is up until comparatively recently, the primary model people had for changing opinion Political forming political opinion was what they would call cues, not as in standing in a line, as in theatre cues. So you took a cue from something authoritative that yeah. you aligned with, and that's what set your view. So like the church, yeah, the church told you what to think, or you were a Labour person and Labour told you what to yeah. think, or you were Radio a Tory and the Tories, yeah. or the BBC, you were a, a royal loyalist. The Queen just said that. What happened is over the course of the eighties and the nineties. Trust in institutions, trust in authority figures collapsed. Is that still um, the case? Oh, oh yes. Oh, is absolutely. The case? Now, yeah. I'm going to explain that it's not really true, but it is. But, so, yeah. what has replaced it is secondary conversations about the public realm. It is not being told by a Clement Attlee figure that the NHS is good for you. It's hearing the option of something like an NHS and discussing it with your peers at work, at the school gates. Opinions are formed as peers are talking to each other for mutual reassurance. Now, what some people get wrong who are too hard on the peer-to-peer -peer is the idea that they're not, that the public hasn't got any, that the authority figures don't have any say. No, they still control the terms of the debates. But they also control what the media, which controls what people discuss. Put to the public. What, what, but if, it, if the media is discussing, is creating the terms. Sorry, say that again. There was a. Yeah. So if the media is, but the, the, the problem, I, I agree with what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, if the media is then deciding, Daily Mail decides, you know, the, the media, Scottish media, currency the, is a the disaster. The discussion in school gate then is, is Scottish currency or Welsh currency is a disaster, isn't it? So no, no, they, no, the media can frame just... the debate. Thankfully, most well, thankfully or not, thankfully, most people have to take their news from the BBC, which is biased, but it can't be that biased. If you look, let's 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 face it. If you're buying the Daily Mail, you're no voting indie. So let's just don't get too hung up. <laughs> People get really hung up about the media. It's like I mean, it's like the weather. We're British. The, it will piss down with rain, and the media will behave like a bunch of farmyard animals. These things are two inevitabilities of being British. So we've we've developed this really effective means of 
just been waterproof for barbecues because it will fucking rain if we all get sorry i'm swearing it <laughs> will rain if we have a barbecue we've got to take a stimuli stoic approach with the me media it will always be there doing the shitey stuff it does we've got to work around it that's the benefit of this peer-to-peer -peer. it's exactly how um the bernie sanders campaign operated it's exactly how black lives matters have operated there's social campaigns all over the place which are doing this and they're shifting opinion outside elections because what they're doing is they are training people we've got loads of soft yes activists and we're not training them to have effective conversations with their families, their colleagues, their... And if you go even beyond that, and I don't want to give it away too much because it's yeah. a secret, but um, if you're really good with this, you can pair people up and sustain and monitor conversations over a period of time and get assessments of, I'm shadowing three um, possible yes voters. One of them is still 50-50. I the other one has tipped over into being gently yes, and the other one's completely convinced. You can feed that back. You can use in software, you can say, that's us. We've not only got 60% or 58%, enough of them are far enough up the spectrum that we can be confident they'll turn out. So if you take, if you take, I would call them prolonged managed conversations yeah. with peers. It's how to change opinion, along with stunts and ideas and visuals. And you need materials to get people excited, but it's not enough. You need to I, then I have conversations with them about it. Yeah, I won't go into the segmentations of society. So you could be having conversations with people who are already like you and not with the people you need to win, who are people you don't really like or have anything in contact. In no, no, wait, wait, this thing that I'm not telling you about because it's still secret is specifically designed to peer oh, right. you. So does that mean we have to speak to people we really don't like, Robin? Oh, no. Welcome to the world. <laughs> right, I, I, see, I, this, I, is, this is the funny thing. Do you know my single biggest skill set as a political strategist comes yeah. from? It what? comes from growing up in a small town. Well, I live in a small I, town. I, I know I, people I, don't I, want to see here. I grew up, that's the point though. You've still got to learn some means of coping with them. Oh yes, of course. Because yeah. I can't just go saying, you've just said something I don't like, I'm cutting you out, because um, I'm going to bump you into the co-op tomorrow and I need to be able to at least say <laughs> hello politely. Yeah. And it's a brilliant way. Most political strategists are urban based yeah. and they get themselves into wee segmented bubbles. I live in a no-voting town with Tory farmers, a lot of whom are close personal friends. It's not a skill set of mine. I was just lucky yeah. to be in a mixed community. And it's really good at giving you a perspective of people who are not like you. So find someone who's not like you and make friends. You'll find out they've got more <laughs> in confidence, more in common with them than you actually think. And it can be a very engagement, it can be a very engaging relationship as long as you don't imagine you're going to win them over completely in your first contact. Oh. You're listening to me, Sean Jobbins, here on Radio Yes Company Podcast. I'm with uh, Robin McAl McAlpine from Common. We have a very interesting conversation. We're discussing basically the whole of Scotland at the moment. So, I mean, it, it was going to be a 45-minute conversation. I think we're well over that. But, I mean... I think we've got a bit more time because there's so much more to ask, Robin, and, and, and thanks for giving your time and, and being so openly and, and interestingly about the situation up there. So, okay, so we have the situation of the SNP now, which is looking pretty bad. There's going to be a bonkersly short election for no reason. It should have been three or four months, just to give people time. We've got three candidates, whatever you think about them, just put a name, the head on a block is a big thing. We then got, if you like, some kind of critique of what happened wrong since the devolution, the referendum, the independence referendum in 2014. You've got some good ideas uh, and there's some things you think needs to be nailed down. So how actually then, what is actually the, the, the steps, the chronology for getting independence for Scotland? I mean, are we talking about winning a, re um, a referendum? I'm sorry to use that word. Are we talking about just doing claim, um, declaring UDI? Uh, well, how does it happen? Um, and also, the other thing to check in, you know, the Brits aren't stupid. They've spent 700 years in our case, 300 years in your case, of bribes, bullets and lies mm -hmm. about getting, about get, you know, so there's institutional uh, memory within the Westminster mm -hmm. system of how to bully and bribe people into getting what they want. They've learned some lessons from 2014, I'm guessing. They've also learned some lessons from 2016, the 
Brexit. They will also use that, and I, I guess in their line would be Brexit wasn't such a good idea. You know, it was a mistake. It was a big change. Do you really want to do that now with independence, which would be the obvious line for them to take? And also the other big thing is if there is change in Westminster with Starmer getting elected for Labour, which should probably happen, uh, I'm still never 100% you know, the Tories won't lose. But I mean, it looks likely that Labour will win in a couple of years' time. Doesn't that then just chuck off course you know, the whole independence narrative for Scotland and in Wales, or that there's no chance of change through Westminster? So how does the independence movement deal so with those, take those take, Let me take those many questions in reverse order. Yes, Number okay. one, you think Starmer's going to bring change? Is this because, a different well, Starmer you know, we're talking about? Yes, but he... Yeah. Starmer's going to Starmer's going to do a case for us. He's going to be a change. He's going to be a change, and that change is going to deliver precisely the same austerity budgets that um. What, what okay? Plan. What happens? Okay, just to, just to be devil's advocate, what happens if Starmer gets in? I think you're right. I think Starmer. Well, if, Starmer he's if he's radical and starts the National Health Service equivalent, you know, if he came in, he was really radical, changes everything, runs a massive Green New Deal, reindustrializes yeah. Britain. I mean, I sure, but he's not going to. But what if he's doing as a Bernie Saunders, as you alluded to half an hour ago, an hour ago, I don't remember now. So yeah. basically he's pushed into a situation partly because you know, the economy is in a bad situation he's or whatever. He's just cut. He's just basically expelled everyone from his party who might have pushed him. I mean, don't kid on what's going on in Labour. Yeah, look, I, I'm, no... not, I'm not really an apologist. I... I know. No, no, <laughs> I'm just saying. Just, hey, yeah. Starmer's pushed everyone out. And there's another thing as well, which is I've been collecting this now since 1997 because 95, 6. Remember that I was there when you labour yeah. in the inside of it. Yeah. And they were all saying, shh, tapping the side of their noses, giving you a wink. Yeah. We've got to pretend we're really conservative now, but just you wait to see how radical we are in government. Well, here's my contention. Nobody was ever more radical in government than they were out of government. So take what they're saying with anybody. Take what they're saying outside government. Cut 30%. That's what they're going to do. But would, would, never, would, It's never add 30%. I've no, never but would, ever uh, seen an administration that adds 30%. And he's offering bugger all, so you can probably assume that he's going to give bugger all minus 30%. That's the real but, but, but would people in Scotland say, okay, you know, yeah, he's not great, but this is as good as it gets. And it's better... To have some incremental, some change through Westminster, and it's safe. There's no, there's no disruption of independence and a new currency. And what happens to my pension? And you know what happens to the Coast Guards? You know, it's safer to stay with the devil. We know it's not fantastic, but you know, I'm, I only live right. Yeah, but so every 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 version of everything that's what you're fighting. Every ver social change is always a question of something better that people are nervous about going for, or something less good. That seems safe because it's there. That's every single social change. If we were to if we were to curl up in a ball and start crying because that's what we faced, <laughs> we might as well just all go home. That's the that's the baseline nature for people that want to bring change. Um, is Starmer going to be? Is there, there is an argument to have about does Starmer take the pressure off the uh, the impression of? Britain being rubbish because of Tories? Mm. Or does he contribute to the fact that Tories labour, it doesn't make any difference? Well, I'm going to really, really... I said this at the Mellon draft conference. Yeah. I'm going to do it again. I'm going to give my Presbyterian stare, my <laughs> stern Presbyterian stare. It's not in your hands. You must... You cannot sit around hoping the outside world's going to chuck you favours. You must assume it's not. You must assume that everyone is trying to stop you because they kind of are. Um, it's up to you what you do with it. So if you want to accept the, the Starmer frame, which is, I'm afraid, is part of this, another reason I don't think Sturgeon was desperately keen to stay on for a long term was her whole, her whole performance, her whole act was, oh, them Tories, what are they like? If only there was grown-ups in the room. Well, I mean, Starmer's going to pull off the grown-up in the room and look. Yeah. So what's he going to do? So no, I'm perfectly confident that Labour's not going to transform anyone's lives. I'm perfectly confident that three years into Starmer, say, um, nurses are still going to have shit jobs. There's still going to be any manufacturing. We're still going to be seeing public services getting squeezed. Local government's still going to be in its arse. I don't believe there's going to be major substantive change. It'll probably, probably stop getting worse. 
a slower, it'll get worse at a slower rate. But I don't rate Starmer. I also don't think he's going to get in with a strong majority. He's, I've never seen a candidate who is so far in the lead by default. I mean, it's not just me, but I've, I've, I've no, talking, no, 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 no. I've just been talking to London-based political, like political strategists. Right. What they say is we've never seen such soft numbers for someone against a government that's this bad. Almost the entire Starmer vote is an anti-Tory vote. Yeah. If the Tories could pull off a popular candidate, Starmer can lose this. Yeah. I mean, oh, yeah, that's, yeah. that's what I yeah. find remarkable. So, yeah. so what I'm saying about this is, events, dear boy, they're going to happen. No point in greeting about them. Be clever. Play them. Okay. That's all you can Okay, do. fine. So that's, that's one thing. Right. So the question unschooled... before that was people trying to stop you. And you were talking about the establishment. Yeah. Once again, I, people won't know this. My mother was one of the leading, still is, one of the leading anti-nuclear figures in Britain. Um, she was a member of, for those that have long memories, um, she was, as a 17-year-old, she was a member of the Committee of 100s that started the anti-nuclear movement. Well, for, for, uh, people know, because the anti-nuclear movement in the 1950s and early, sorry, 1960s was viewed as being virtually terrorist, to oppose the British military was was really severely not the thing. They created the Committee of 100, which was basically the idea that if 100 very senior or very respected leading figures collectively did this, they couldn't arrest them all. Oh, it's okay. And that was basically what started C&D. Now, of course, they were correct. Nobody did arrest the, the Committee of 100. What they arrested was all the staff. <laughs> they literally jailed all the staff. But they yeah. didn't. So it's people like Bertrand Russell and Margaret Atwood. Yeah. Um, not Margaret Atwood, uh, Doris Lessing. They, they, they basically, they couldn't jail some of the most eminent people in Scotland, in Britain, so they jailed everyone else. So my mum was one of the Committee of 100 as, a, as an 18-year-old Scottish political activist on the ground. And um, let me just put it like this. Growing up in the 1980s, you would, most phone calls, you'd get a click 20 seconds after. Yeah, okay. Right, so we weren't, I mean, don't kid on that we weren't the subject of um, political uh, observation from the British state. Yeah. And um, that's what they do. And I'm going to say the same thing. Do you think that's ever not the case? I mean, don't, don't, it's just there. There's nothing you can do. If they, they've, they've, the, the thing that the British state does is it infiltrates bodies it has no place infiltrating, denies it until 20 years later when he says, oh, that was terrible. We're never going to do that again. So it was yeah, well, anti, anti-racist movements in the 1950s. It was the bloody Labour government in the 1960s. It was the trade unions in the 1970s and the 1980s. It was the environmental movement in the 1990s. It's still the environmental movement now. There's been infiltration of social movements since time immemorial. So just accept it. But there's also an interesting way to look at this, which is, as, as somebody who watches to see these things, there's nothing you could do, but you can assess what's happening. It's quite interesting. They're clearly taking a dual, a dual strategy. So on the one hand, they are, I mean, I don't doubt they're working against Scottish independence and gently in the security services. They haven't had to do much, to be honest, but um, yeah. I'm sure they are. But there's another thing that they were doing, which is, They've also hedged their bets because I think quite a lot of them think Scotland's a lost cause and they're going to lose Scotland. So they are, what they've actually potentially arguably been putting more effort into is to making the, the SNP good Atlanticists so they can keep all the no, nuclear okay. bases. So if you look at where there's been extensive state interference or intervention in Scottish in the SNP, it's actually much more to do with bringing their position in NATO round. They haven't yet you turned on opposing nuclear weapons in Scottish soil, but the key people in the party who are pushing this have started be slipping in words like multilateral rather than unilateral, which tells you all you need to know. So if you ask me what the British state is doing at the moment is it's taking a watching brief on the cause of independence because we've not made any great progress and we've not really had any momentum. Meanwhile, it is working to try and say if this falls through, how can we ensure the tamest possible Scottish state? Yeah. I don't think that's controversial at all. I think it's quite straightforwardly the case that they have been trying to pull the SNP into the mainstream. Well, I mean, yeah, but I mean, I think the war in Ukraine also sort of makes a case. Oh, that... no, this has gone way back. This is the way it goes. This goes way back to two thousand and thirteen. Okay, okay, so then, so yeah, basically, just plow ahead, plow ahead with the, your plans because there's always going to be some bastards who are trying to mess it up. Fine. 
Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, they're, they're just going to do it. And, yeah. and I, 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 I hate to raise sport with poor rails at the moment. <laughs> it's, it's kind of like saying, but that big bastard over there is trying to tackle me. I know, yeah. you're, okay, you're that's his job. Game. That's his yeah. job. That's what you do. Yeah. Just accept it and get on with it. There's no point in complaining. Okay, so this independence animal... Uh, how does it how does it creep or, or gallop over the border to get independence for Scotland? What's it? Gonna, it's going to be a referendum, UDI. Well, how's it going to happen? Don't Robert? worry about it. It's not how it changes. That's not how society changes. Um, right. Society changes. But it's, it's handy to have that in terms of the focus of people, or maybe to galvanise people, maybe to give so, people I, some I, kind of deadline. Because I think people are thinking. Big, I'm a big fan of. Ahead. I'm a big fan of democracy, but let me take it in steps. Um, in fact, let me let me do the very quick version of this. I try to get across this to everyone because there's an enormous amount of confusion about this in Scotland. If you pick 10 independence supporters, you'll get seven interpretations of what the route to independence is. So I, I try to give it's people... So, well, then two of them will agree because they read the same <laughs> websites. Um, <laughs> the, so I, I try to put it like this. What's the legal definition of independence? There isn't one. There's no international court where you can go... Okay, recognition by the UN. Sue. Right, so it's the recognition by the UN is realistically when you become an independent state. Yeah. So to be recognised by the UN, you need two-thirds of the General Assembly members to vote and nobody in the Security Council to be to you. How do you get that? Very simple. There's two ways you can broadly do it, or two or three ways, but the two basic ways are either you've got to show that de facto facts on the ground, you are complete and utter control of your territory, i.e. Yeah, so monopoly on, on terror within your territory. Yeah, well, you need, you need, to, you need to have your army, yeah. your police. Yeah. Then monopoly on terror. Like, right, and it, so that, that you can do that. That's not a route for us. Yeah. The other one is get a, get a recognition agreement from the country from which you're ceding. Yes. Right? That one, once you've got that, if you've got a recognition agreement from the country from which you are leaving, Everyone else is just going to say, oh, whatever, then they're fine, yeah, they're fine. Yeah. So, independence for Scotland is a recognition agreement with the UK. Everything else is just a question of how we get that recognition agreement. Now, that recognition agreement will not come without strong majority support among the population, the settled will. Yeah. 56, 57, 58. Until that, it will not come. But once you've got that settled will, the means of dragging them to the table are various. So the obvious one's just hold another referendum, win it, done. But I have no doubt that there are circumstances in which you can just phone up the UK and you say, we can press an advantage here and make this really difficult for you, or we could just open up negotiations now. And if they thought they were going to get crushed in a referendum, say, they yeah. might just say, well, hell's teeth, let's, let's, let's go from a position of comparative strength and negotiate now. You could declare UDI and bluff them to the table, see what happened. I don't think it's a clever idea. You could use a ref, a, an election as a... a, a well, when, what, what if they do the, 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 the Spanish and the Catalan thing? You know, there was a majority of people for independence of Catalonia. More, a bigger percentage voted for it than for Brexit across the UK, even though basically the Spanish boycotted it. Yeah, but that was... A, that was. I mean, again, you're slightly struggling to say that of all eligible voters in the whole country, we got a majority of people at the, the ballot box. That's the difficulty. This is all about... Everything in politics is about perception. If everyone believes you're legitimate, basically you're legitimate. And if people have questions about your legitimacy, you are contested. And the problem in Catalonia was it was always contested. It was never quite clear that because there was no no side, because it was a unilateral thing, and because there wasn't a baseline. So, for example, in Scotland, I keep saying to people, we've got a baseline. We just got to get more people now voting yes than voted no or supported yes than supported no. What the Brits said, look, just don't turn to vote. It's a, it's a, it's a make-believe referendum. It's a joke referendum by a bunch of people. That's very that's the point. That's the point. That's the the reason why a referendum in itself isn't it. It's got. It's about perception. It's about having the perception that the game's up. You've got strong majority support. Now, you can keep going with this. You can go all the way to non-violent civil disobedience. You can go to revolutions if you want. The point is you just got to keep pushing the pressure harder and harder and harder until they say this isn't working anymore. So, like I say, if we held that, let's say we had a methodology of demonstrating 58% of the Scottish voting public were now pro-independence and Westminster still wasn't. Okay, you've earned the perception that you can go in buses 
yeah. do a mass sit down and close Westminster for days. You can go full Gandhi at that point. Mm. And the point is that folk know you can do that. A yeah. British state isn't stupid. It knows you can do that. So the question is, it's just a game of chicken. You've just got to keep upping the pressure to the point somewhere bef somewhere below civil war, somewhere above, we can keep ignoring this law. That's that's basically <laughs> a very broad sweet spot. So what I keep saying to people is, think about it as, now I'm careful how I phrase this. I, I've been using the phrase dominance, but it sounds a bit bad in public. But in politics, it, well, again, for those in Wales who can still follow the rugby without crying, um, we talk about, you know, <laughs> There's a lot and there's a lot of talk about you know dominant tackles, dominant positions. Yeah. Right. If you're in a dominant position, yeah. the referee looks at what happened and assumes the other guy's done the wrong thing. That's yeah. the perception. So we've got to get in a dominant position, which means majority support in our case. From a dominant position, we can trigger mechanisms for making it untenable to keep saying no. And that's yeah. why I say think about it, dominance, trigger. Stop worrying about the trigger until you can generate more of the dominance. So yeah, so to be or to put another, you, you you become the moral majority. Yeah, well we we've got the terminology in Scotland because of Kenyon Wright referring to the settled will of the Scottish yes. people. So that yeah. concept of settled will has a particular resonance in Scotland, and that's yeah. what we're looking for. You now, there are we can talk about variations and sprinklings and details indefinitely here. So. You could absolutely say we can only get so far with this without some sort of electoral point. You might get people contesting that it's a settled well. There's nothing is black and white. This is a this is somewhere between a negotiation with the public. That's actually it's, it's just a negotiation with the public. It's about asking the public to believe that you've won, and that's yeah. that's what we've got to do. We've got to generate that. That idea that we have the overwhelming weight of justice is behind us. And in a democracy, it's hard to hold back from that. Now, we are not Spain. Spain is a hellhole. I mean, I, I say that with, I love Spain. I've got family yeah, all over Spain. No, but I mean, I've got supporters here. But their legal system and their constitution. Well, it's skewed. The, the system's. Well, it's not just skewed. Made, People don't yes. really understand this. It was written. I know. The Franco era, yes, and it's never been revised. It's basically uh, a constitution that was written five minutes after Franco. And part of the deal of the post-Franco era was the judges all the Francoist judges all kept their places. So you've you've got a democratic Spain with a Francoist judicial system. Yeah, well, it's constitutional we courts refused any more devolution for Catalonia, which yeah, kicked the, the, whole the concept. Off. The, the concept that that we could have had civic society a uh, activists leading senior civil society activists jailed in Britain no, no, so. for campaigning isn't, that's not possible. We're not in the same situation as Spain. So that level of repression, they, they find it quite hard to Dublin us. You know, we, they can't send in the army anymore. It's a soft, po it's a soft power era and we win on the basis of soft power. That's it. So this is what I keep saying to folk, everybody, Stop talking about referendums. It could be. It probably <laughs> is. It might not be. Yeah. But we've got lots to do before then. And no, if we do absolutely everything that we need to do, fill out our case, persuade Scotland we are indie ready, that we are good to go, that we've got everything. If we do absolutely everything, we still might get stonewalled. And at that point, we need to escalate. However, I, this is... So that's another thing that I, I lecture social movements on so much. Everybody in the history of the world, you, you must earn your escalations. You can't just go escalate. The public must feel that your escalation is reasonable yeah. or you're the idiot. Right? So yeah. you've got to have the public feeling that your escalation is reasonable. You must earn your escalations. And every social movement I've ever known believes it's earned more of an escalation than it actually has. People escalate too fast. You must do the stuff that you can do first. So we've got to fill in the case. We've got to set up a campaign. We've got to start campaigning with people. We've got to do all of that. Once we've done that, if it's not quite enough, then consider the next thing. But you do that. Ask this, the, this is the foundation of everything else. We don't have the foundations in place. We're trying to build a house on top of it, and it won't work. 
get your foundations right first. And we'll talk about the next bit if we get to the next bit. But right now in Scotland, we've got work to do. And we need to crack so, so, so basically Scotland, to some extent, needs something like a Yes Cymru, which is non-party political, mass movement, just doing the, dog, the donkey work, getting out, talking to people, doing the, well, the rallies, the banners and bridges, giving leaflets out before on train stations as they were in Cardiff and pretend and Llanelli people in places away before that terrible rugby match on Saturday. So that needs to be genied up again. You know, that it's already yeah, it's exactly what we need. We need a civic movement, but then there's two other things we need. We need yep. the Scottish government to get a grip on its domestic agenda. It's really difficult to do all this if, a, if an independent supporting government screwing everything up yes. every day. Yeah. They need to get a grip on government and there's one other piece of alchemy that's required to make this work is those two have got to join up. It, the, the government has, the Scottish government's finally got to turn around and open itself up to the independence movement and vice versa. The way that I've been phrasing it is we've, they've got to chuck us the ball from government. The government can't run this. It's got to get its government domestic policy agenda together. Can't run a bloody impact campaign at the same time, but we can't run it in divorced or separated from the dominant political party of Scottish independence. We need a relationship and we don't have one. So we need to have a, we need a strong civic movement to run the campaigning. Yeah. We need a strong Scottish government to persuade people that it's not going to be a disaster. And we need them talking to each other. We need them in a relationship which coordinates and pushes things forward. So, so if I can just chuck this in cheekily, I will come to the end conversation yeah. soon. Um, so basically, you're saying, uh, Robin McAlpine, that your Hamza is correct. You know, it's referendum or independence in what twenty fifty, isn't it? I mean, why the rush? Why is the twenty independence free by twenty twenty three? So basically, Hamza's right, isn't he, Robin? You know, we you need to build this movement first. Well, I mean, there's a couple of things to say about that. First thing to say about that is I didn't say a type. Even scale, things move at the pace at which things move, and you can make them move at the pace that you want them to move at. Um, I think that a realistic time scale for us being on the verge of this is from when we're prepped and we start. I'd say 24, 36 months. I'm confident that. Oh, yeah, oh yes, absolutely. What's that? What's that, you. what's that in years? Two, you're talking like pregnant women always talk about third semester. I got to work it out. That's three years. Two three years. Like, three that's years. easier for me to understand, Robin. Thanks. Two years, three years. Right. All right. That's, God, that's, 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 that's my. Quick. Once we're all formed, once we've done all the housekeeping. Yeah. So from from the, having stuff together. So, so once we're in a place and everyone started doing their thing, that's yeah. a perfectly reasonable. Remember, I wouldn't say that if I didn't think there was ten percent of. Well, we know. That there's about six or seven percent of the Scottish population that's willing to talk, think about independence because they keep fucking changing their yeah. mind, they keep popping <laughs> in the mood. But we know that they are at least willing, so we know there's 10 percent that's not going to take that much work to bring over. That's why I'm reasonably confident about this. Also, remember, I was saying that we've not done this background work. Well, actually, we have. It's just that government doesn't accept it. Commonweal has done a lot, the Scottish Currency Group has done a lot. There are about two or three bodies that have been working in building constitutions. For an independent Scotland, there's a lot of work been done in that. And there's been work being common. I mean, we did work. <laughs> I keep picking coast guards because we did all of it. We did coast guards, currency. The other is a is a charity, so in, in effect, there's no so difference which state runs the coast guards because it's the CRNLI's job. Well, I but no, well, I no, it's a bit more than you're you're mixing up the coast guard with the RNLI. Oh, RNLI but... rescues people. The coast guard catches. Oh, drug you know, dealers, yeah. Drug dealers, and right. just just to get an idea about. Oh, well, that's all fine. We can just do that. Well, you do know that we've got no Coast Guard. Yeah, because you know, the Irish Republic no... has one, doesn't it? And they oh, we don't really. They, we yeah. don't have, we do not have clippers, well, vessels. intercept yeah. vessels in Scottish waters yeah. because Thatcher decided that the purpose of customs and excise was going to be switched round to catch poor people skipping out on beer. On, on beard on fag duty. So she basically took all, all the controls away. We've got very little um we've well, got ask the Irish to go take over the Western coast, but I mean so so, so anyway, yeah. what I'm saying is there's way more work that's been done right. than it might look, but it doesn't mean anything if it isn't so all in subterranean same at the moment. And everybody says, Yes, we all agree this is this is the the 
the core platform. So that's what we've got to do. So it's not it's not massive, insane amounts of work. It's just it needs to get done now. Okay, this is the last question because I mean I am. Really I've not had my tea yet. Right. I'm, I'm watching <laughs> slow horses on the telly here. And it's exciting. <laughs> So, I mean, and you know, this is the, the big question. I mean, from my reading of history, independence for countries happens in phases, you know, and they doesn't become independent the same year, does it? So post-First World War, after a huge catastrophic war, which upset everything, then you have the collapse of the Soviet Union, a huge um, catastrophic or a huge uh, change, uh, um, earthquake. Looking at the world as it is, is Scotland going to become independent you know, by itself? I mean, looking back in ways, 1979, you know, we, we weren't ready, whatever. But there's also a feeling that in the middle of the Cold War, you know, there was this uh, existential fear for a lot of people who needs to be a part of big states to be safe. Um, I don't know, is the international, the global, the European setting ripe for a country like Scotland becoming independent because it didn't happen for anyone else for like 50 years after the Second World okay. War. But, until re but remember, this is one of the mistakes I think we've made, and I, I keep lecturing my many, many friends across Europe about this. You know that there are probably more autonomy movements in Europe than there are member states of the uh, EU. I mean, yeah, of course, yeah. So, I mean, I'll just tell you that we start right. in the very north and we go Faroes, Greenland, Scotland, Wales, Ireland, Cornwall, Brittany. Provence, North Basque Country, South Basque Country, Catalonia, Flanders, uh, North East, what do you call it? Um, North East of bloody Spain's got one as well. Oh, yeah, Azores Galicia. Have got, Galicia. The Azores have got an independence movement, South Tyrol, the Veneto, Sicily, Sardinia. I don't think all Corsica. those are, yes, I think some they're of those are. They're all at different states. Yes, and I think but, some are more credible than others. For doing yeah, but I mean, because yes. this is absolutely true, and there's more developed than others, but what yeah. I'm trying to point out is we are at a point which since there's since the imperial era, yeah. there has never been such a period of centralisation and disempowerment of regions, cultures, and nations. It's partly neoliberal capitalism. It's partly European Union. Um, Somebody had to be the first one. To go. Oh yeah, so, so you'll be the first. Are we, and you're the are we on our own or are we the first? Yes, and I think you'd the be answer it. is I think we're probably the first. Um, and if you want to look at the big global context in which we do things, there's another one, which is look at climate change. Climate change is in some ways a gift to Scottish nationalism, because we are just about one of all the countries in the world. <laughs> you're laughing. We're, we're, la we're high. La we're we're, we're, we're high laughing high as well. If we had, I, I was. You need the wall. But yeah, we need the wall. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the best. But no, the, the, we're high lying, loads and loads of space, renewable yeah. energy coming out of our ears. Small population. Small population. Everything that you need to survive the global climate apocalypse, <laughs> we've got in Scotland. So there is always an international global context. And once again, I will always make the point that it's what you it's not the context, it's what you do with the context that counts. So it's not very well saying, oh, well, you know, the, the, the conditions were ripe for India. But we disempower activists with this. India yeah. had fought for a hundred years in multiple phases with multiple leaders to get itself in a position where it was inevitable. And it was by this point inevitable. Yes. But we've got to be careful not to write out the agency of societies and freeing themselves. And yes, they do tend to but, and, yes, and but, but this is the bravery of the you know the Lithuanian but that's because doctors. that's because it's like Arab Spring the courage of one courage is infectious the courage of one makes you ask why not us and that's the, the thing I feel most well, guilty about 2014 uh, is I hoped that we were just going to open the door for Wales well, I, I, hope, I hoped as well but I mean yes and in 1986 I had a post on my wall uh, by CMN, which is a Catalan NGO, and maps of the, the nations and uh, languages of Europe, which included Estonia, Latvia, and Slovenia, and Ukraine. Uh, these were totally ignored, of course, by the, the experts in the International Politics Department in Aberystwyth, mm -hmm. uh, and, and all 
sensible people, but you know, three years later, those countries were independent or effectively were. Mm -hmm. And it's because of, yeah, because people decided they wanted to be independent, essentially. Mm -hmm. uh, Robin McAlpin, it's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you. One of the most interesting conversations I've ever had. It's been long. But you know, think it's 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 been bad for your your diet or whatever. But in no, no, so I've got to get this this Christmas. But plenty, but but plenty of but plenty of food for thought, if I may bring in the pun. <laughs> so, and can I just emphasise this? The reason why I'm always so keen to do this is nothing makes movement stronger than cross movement collaborations. Yeah. I want more than anything for Wales and Scotland to work closer together and yeah. work and see ourselves as a joint cause much more. Um, this is why I love coming down to Wales and, yeah. and getting involved with your... With well, it was a fantastic uh, independence summit by the Merlin Drive, but I hope to see more stuff like that. I know the all under one banner people, uh, Llewellyn um, has been in touch with the, the people up there, and also, yes, Cymru are in touch with lots of people. So this is all good stuff, and I think we've got a lot to learn. There's a lot of differences, obviously, between Wales and Scotland, but it's so interesting to discuss things. And I think what you're saying is basically we, could, we have to just concentrate on our game. We, we can't... We can't be responsible for what the mistakes or whatever the other people do. Understand your opponent, moments. understand your opponent, understand how they move, and then focus on your game. There's nothing else you can yep. do. You've got no option. There's no other way to play the game. No. Focus on what you can do. Good. Robin, again, thanks for your time. You've been listening to the Radio Yes Company podcast. We've got more stuff coming on over the coming months. Uh, keep following us on on Facebook, on Twitter on YouTube, through the Yes Company's website, and also um, through uh, your local or whichever podcast uh, app you use. Uh, Robin, until then, until next time we speak, it'd be good maybe to speak up in a year's time to see how things oh, are going. I'd love to. And um, we'll take a plane. Dior Cavalry, thanks again. We'll speak again. And uh, thanks again for you to listening to Radio Yes Company. Right, I'm just going to try and... Don't tell me. Was that how long was that? <laughs> yes. A half.